Support for Lab Out Loud is provided by NSTA, the National Science Teaching Association. Find out more about what NSTA has to offer at nsta.org. You're listening to Lab Out Loud, Science for the Classroom and Beyond. And today, our guest has spent a lot of time in Greenland. So we land in, essentially in the middle of the ice sheet. And when the plane takes off, we're just there. It's, it's really, really, really remote. It's a very stark environment. It's just snow and ice as far as the eye can see in all directions. And very subtle things like tiny changes in humidity or the wind or smells in the air, you just really start to pick up on after a few days. And it's on a still day when the wind's not blowing. It's, it's just so quiet. Uh, and it's, it's really incredible in a lot of ways. That's up next on Lab Out Loud, but first, I'm your co-host Dale Basler. And I'm Brian Bartel. And Brian is the one that's been hunting down all these researchers, and it's been fascinating. Well, I, I took a stab at connecting with some researchers on, we would call it science Twitter, basically. And there's two things that I thought that were, were wonderful. Number one, I followed a lot of these scientists, and following their work sometimes is so much more uplifting than some of the news that we see in regular Twitter. Uh-huh, and so sure. uh, I actually, it's been a nice diversion. So thank you, Science Twitter. This all got started when I followed someone and it it turned out to be like, a, there was a list of people to follow and I just reached out to a handful of them at a time on Twitter uh-huh. and wanted to know if they wanted to be part of the show. And some of you might have, if you follow the Lab Out Loud Twitter handle, you may have seen some of those come through. And it was overwhelming response from them. And I, I apologize, I'm still trying to get back to some of you yeah. who have um, expressed interest on in being on the show. We've already uh, done a number of interviews with some of you, and it's been it, they, they've been fabulous. Uh, one of the things we wanted to do was to talk to real scientists in the field mm-hmm. and tell us about their work and how they got into what they study and you know how why they're passionate about it. That's been particularly interesting, too, is just to hear people's paths, you know, um, you know, our focus being science education and how did science education reach these people who now are in the thick of science research. And I'll have to be honest, um, you know, my kids are they're in middle school right now. And one of the things they're starting to do a little bit more is like career investigations. And, yeah. you know, sometimes the career investigations come up a little you know, stale. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure like even scientist as one thing is so generic a term that I don't think that does justice to what is out there. So this is part of finding out what what you can be as a scientist and what you can do uh, while researching scientists as a You know, those programs usually just put like, you know, what are your options? But they 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 don't always put like a human face on it, which is harder to do because you have to make a connection with somebody. And uh, that's what um, has been interesting about having some of these conversations with researchers. So we will have a few of these throughout the season, actually. And like I said, we mm-hmm. already have a few recorded. The first one is uh, with a researcher who has spent a lot of time on ice, literally in Greenland. My name is uh, Mike McFerrin. I am a researcher, a postdoctoral associate at the University of Colorado in Boulder, and I am a glaciologist. So I study glaciers and ice sheets. My main focus is on the big ice sheets, Greenland and Antarctica. Uh, and I've led up uh, a large project funded by NASA where we've been taking measurements in Greenland for a number of years now uh, and have led a number of field teams on the ice. So that is part of my job. Uh, to be out on the ice sheet, uh, drilling cores and setting stations and taking measurements. So you really don't have like spring break trips to warm places? No, not really anymore. (laughs) Uh, Nope. Usually when we get to, when we get the funding, we, we, we take a, a big trip up to the very cold places. So we'll spend April and May up in, up on the Greenland ice sheet. Is that what it's typically, uh, the length is two, two months or so or, uh, Anywhere from I've been up on the ice sheet as short as a month and as long as six weeks uh, at a stretch. So it really varies on the trip and what we're needing to do uh, and how much work we have to do. Do you just fly in? Uh, So we usually take advantage of uh, um, the National Science Foundation has a lot of support and they actually work with the New York Air National Guard. And so we take these big military C-130 planes uh, up to Greenland um, and then fly fly those out to the ice and they drop us off. We can get a big C-130 cargo plane that'll drop us off with six people, four snowmobiles, 
4,000 pounds of gear uh, and we'll load up snowmobiles and, and travel around for a month. So uh, it just lands on the ice. Yeah, it's actually some of the world's largest ski planes. Wow. Uh, they've hmm. got skis on the bottom of these big C-130 cargo planes and they'll land well, I them on the ice. I want to see a picture of that. That's cool. I can send you pictures of that. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> So how did you get into this line of work? I mean, uh, you don't just uh, did you wake up one morning and said, I'm going to I'm going to be on the glacier then in my career? No, I was uh, I actually was an engineer in my undergrad. I was a computer engineering manager uh, and I was graduating from college right about the time the dot com bubble was bursting uh, at the start of the um, around 2001. And uh um, I ended up becoming a school teacher, a uh, high school math teacher for five years, um, and then came back to grad school because uh, I really loved teaching, but wanted to teach at a college level, and you need the initials behind your name to do that. So I was like, well, I'll go get a PhD, and then I'll teach at college. Uh, and I went back to a PhD in engineering because that's what my undergrad was in is what I was qualified to do, uh, which isn't a great reason to go and get a PhD in something. Um, and I ended up, after a while, just hating the research. I was not enjoying the project I was on. I wasn't doing well with it. Uh, I was very uninspired by the work. Uh, and and so I was facing a choice where it was becoming more obvious I wasn't going to be finishing out this PhD in computer science. Uh, and so I had choices to make. I could either just cut out and try and um, you know wrap my stuff into a master's and just leave the academic field, but I still really wanted a PhD. And, sure. uh, but a friend of mine was in the geography department at the university and, uh, was saying, well, you know, there's this new professor that does, um, that they just hired on that is doing, uh, glacial stuff. And I, I really liked camping and I would spend, you know, do a lot of backpacking and such and being able to incorporate that and in, that kind of stuff into my work really, uh, had, was a big draw for me. And so they, uh, I ended up meeting with this professor who was taking on, new grad students uh and i ended up switching into the uh geography department and he does um remote sensing primarily but uh, like so satellite observations of of ice sheets of greenland mm -hmm. and antarctica and so i ended up uh transitioning into that um and eventually when i was in that program then eventually i wiggled my way onto uh um a, a danish team that was heading up to the ice in greenland up to the ice sheet uh, and spent a week on the ice with that team, uh, and we, and that's really when um, the trajectory of my my studies and my career really took off at that point. Wow. The, is that a typical? I mean, does that happen more frequently than we think? I think about our high school students. They, you know, I have a seventeen year old, and it's all like, what are you going to do in your future? And like, pick it. And uh, but do you see like the the changes and the meandering uh, as kind of a the norm? Uh, it depends. It varies mm -hmm. from person to person. I mean, you hear about folks that, you know, are doing something that they've known they've always wanted to do since they were five years old. I don't uh -huh. think that's, I don't think that's the norm. Uh, sure. I've certainly taken a meandering path. Um, I mean, I think some of the most interesting adults I know are still trying to figure out what they want to do with their lives. Uh, yeah. and so, uh, I, um, yeah, I mean, I sort of stumbled into this path. Uh, I don't want to say on accident, but it was it no, was not yeah, I get it, it, yeah. not my original plan. Um, but I've been very happy since I got here. It's been it's been a, a th uh, something that I've been very happy with. Well, you're not grading math tests anymore. That's one thing, right? <laughs> Uh, it's fine you say that. I am teaching a course at the university this fall, uh, so it's not quite a math test, but it's. Uh, you don't have to write show your work on anything, or <laughs> not not so much. Uh, <laughs> That's funny. I don't uh, have to so, the principal's office anymore. So oh, there you go. Yeah. So so Greenland. Yes. Not something that. I mean, I know where it is on a map. It's been in the news a little bit, um, but what is it? You know, that first time you visited there, can you take us there? I know this is an audio podcast, but what is it uh, that sets it apart? What what struck you when you first got there um, that made it unique? Besides landing a plane on skis that's and true. on the ice. I mean, that, that is unique. Um, that's an experience when they when these big planes land on the ice. Uh, I'll, I'll answer your question in a moment. But when these big planes land on the ice, they... They do the the Air National Guard practices these what they call combat offloads. So we're all on the plane, and the plane's still moving on the snow like it just landed. It hasn't even stopped yet, and they just open the back door and start unload dropping all the pallets off the back of the plane uh, while it's oh, wow. moving. 
And so you see this big 4,000 pound pallet just fall off the back of the plane. Uh, you're like, oh, wow, this is real. All right. Um, but uh, anyway, yeah, it's Greenland is, I mean, really, in from my experience, there's two parts of it. There's, I mean, people live there. It's, it's a, it's uh, a, a home ruled country and uh, it's the least densely populated country on the planet. It's approximately 56,000 people live on the whole Island. There's more people in Boulder, Colorado than there are in uh, yeah. all of Greenland. But, uh, um, uh, but we usually fly into Greenland and then spend about a week in town and, uh, uh, in a small town on the coast, um, that's our base of operations, and we get all prepped for the ice sheet, and we're packing all our boxes and getting everything prepped, and then we fly it onto the ice, and that's a whole different experience. So we land in essentially in the middle of the ice sheet and get dropped off, and when the plane takes off, we're just there. It's it's flat white snow as far as the eye can see in all directions. Hmm. Uh, we're we're hundreds of miles from the nearest rock, and uh, and standing on, I mean the the ice below us, the snow and ice below us goes down two kilometers, you know, over a mile wow. before, you, mm. before you get to, um, to, to anything that, that looks worldly. Uh, and, uh, and you realize, wow, this is really, really, really remote. And, um, and we'll, you know, we'll drive all day on snowmobiles. And the only way we really know we've gotten from one place to a totally different place is because the GPS tells us that, uh, but, uh, really? <laughs> um, but it's, uh, and we have to navigate by GPS cause there are no landmarks to go by. Um, and so, uh, uh, you know, back in, back in the early days, they always had a, an astronomer with them so that could navigate by sextant and by, uh, by the stars. Uh, and, uh, do you have a guy that's a, somebody doing that backup just in case I, we usually have at least a half a dozen <laughs> GPSs and then sat phones if those, those gave out. So, uh, okay. um, yeah, we, we've, we, we, we do rely on the tech a little bit more, but it's, it's really when we're out on the ice sheet, uh, and it's so remote and it's so it's compared to everywhere else. It's such a sterile environment. Um, you, you start to really tune into very, very subtle smells. For instance, when it's, it's a very stark environment, it's just snow and ice as far as the eye can see in all direction. And, uh, and very subtle things like tiny changes in humidity or the wind or smells in the air. You just really start to pick up on after a few days. And it's oh, wow. uh, your, your, your whole sense of, you know, here in, in the city, you're constantly you drown out all the noise around you and you don't even hear it anymore. Uh, you're bombarded by it. Yeah. Right. All the time. But out there, it's just it's you can just on a still day when the wind's not blowing. It's it's just so quiet. You can't. Uh, and it's it's really incredible. in a lot. So of how, many, how many people are there with you then? Uh, that varies um, mm-hmm. anywhere from a few might be three or four of us up to had teams of 11 or 12. Um on our particular campaigns. I mean, sometimes, you know, it depends on the project, some very large projects where they're doing a drilling, a huge ice core to the bed of the ice sheet over four years, you know, they yeah. might have a whole network of buildings and, uh, and are constantly resupplied by airplanes and have, you know, 50 people on, on board, including cooks and, and mechanics and things like that. Um, our campaigns tend to be smaller. Uh, it's usually half of a dozen of us, six of us on the ice sheet, uh, and snowmobiles to get around. And we sure. just make, make camps along the way. So we'll set up mm-hmm. a, a row of tents and, um, cook for ourselves and, uh, and stay there for a few days, install the stations we need, get the measurements, move on to the next camp. Uh, so, um, do you encounter wildlife in the middle of the ice sheet? Not yeah. often. No, not often. occasionally we see a bird yeah. and it's always like a whole thing when we see a bird. Um, yeah, that's what I was but, wondering. uh, uh, there have been an increasing number of, of instances of polar bears that make their way across the ice sheet. Um, yeah, there's in the last five years, there's been three cases of polar bears making their way into, uh, permanent camps on the ice far inland, hundreds of miles inland. You wonder why these polar bears on the coast decided to just trek into the middle of the ice sheet. But once they caught scent of a camp somewhere, I'm sure they made a beeline for it. Uh, Ah. and so, um, that's a worry. Uh, yeah. Because I mean, if you, if polar bear's hungry by the time it gets to you there, and uh, and it's probably not going away. So no. So do you have to have someone there to help take care of polar bears as well as the astronomer and the? <laughs> uh, I mean, we we have to um, generally where we are doing these snowmobile uh, camps. We're in South Greenland, and there's not nearly as many polar bears as there are, say, in North Greenland, um, and so it's not much of an as much of an issue. But uh, if we are in an area where there's polar bears, you're required to bring a hunting rifle uh mm-hmm. you just have to have one just in case um sure so uh the so, odds for those the odds are low but 
you, you have to account for. Sure. It. What's it like when you come back home then? Because you have sort of like this completely different environment shift. Do you come back home and just like hear everything? It's too loud or? Uh, I mean, one of the biggest things I get is, uh, I mean, in Greenland, there's not many trees, for instance. It's mostly tundra along the coast. And when we're there in late spring, it's not even full summertime yet. It's, it's even the vegetation that is there is kind of brown and dry. And, you know, it's been, it's been all winter since things have been growing. And so I get back home, I'll, it'll be late May and I'll get back to Boulder, Colorado and it's full on springtime. And I just take a little walk along the, the, the creek path. Um, you know, a little creek, uh, runs through town and, and I'm just like, oh my God, this is a rainforest. Uh, mm. And it's really not, but uh, <laughs> but it feels like it when I get home. You're just surrounded by green, and holy cow! Uh, and it's really, uh, yeah. But it just definitely it resets your whole perspective on your senses. There. Do you have problems sleeping at night when you get bombarded by your senses get bombarded by everything when you get back to? You know, funny enough, occasionally. So one thing that happens on the ice sheet i was telling you when it's a still day it's very very quiet but it's not often a still day often the wind is blowing a lot on the ice sheet uh you get just winds that travel across the ice sheet there's nothing to block the winds for hundreds of miles so they really pick up speed and uh and so most nights out there i'm actually falling asleep in a tent to a sound of wind barraging the tent in the background uh it's your own noise machine yeah it's actually my own really loud white noise uh (laughs) and uh and sometimes when i get off the ice then we're back in town and like i'm trying to fall asleep in the room and it's too dang quiet uh oh sure yeah i'm like where's the noise where's the wind uh and uh which is a funny thing i like i don't hear the loud wind i can't fall asleep um but uh, that has happened before. Kind of needed to add one box fan to our expenses. <laughs> All right. So uh, when you're on the ice, you've got uh, what kind of research are you doing there, Mike? So a lot of what we're doing, um, I mean, we're doing several things. Uh, these campaigns, it t- costs a lot of money to get under the ice sheets. So we'll often have several objectives of what we're trying to do when we're out there. But uh, um, a couple of the big things we're doing, uh, we're measuring um, – Stuff that's most of what we're concentrating on in the middle of the ice sheet, our research specifically, is focusing on changes that are happening in the snow layers that are just under the surface of the ice sheet. So snow builds up in the middle of the ice sheet year after year after year. When you drill down through ice core records, that's what you're measuring is these layers of snow that have built up over thousands of years and compressed into ice. Are uh, they like tree rings? Can you measure that yeah, easily? Yeah, they're like tree rings. You can literally oh, – okay. they drill – core when they drill these deep ice cores down through two three kilometers of ice they're measuring tens of thousands in antarctica hundreds of thousands of years of tree rings uh hmm. and they can measure what the atmospheric composition was because there's bubbles trapped in the ice and they can measure oh, sure. um they can measure all kinds of geophysical and chemical properties of the ice um and tell you all sorts of things about that's some of the best records we have of what ancient climate was uh which isn't specifically what i do what i do is look at more recent changes um we're t- uh we're looking at stuff that's just really big changes that have been happening just say in the last 20 years uh as melt water in a lot of these areas you get snow that builds up year after year after year but it melts out a little bit in the summer it'll get warm enough in the summer to cause a little bit of melt that melt water will just trickle down and refreeze in the snow and so you get the snow pack that has these little ice layers scattered throughout it uh but we're what we're seeing is as as more and more melt happens as the summers in Greenland get warmer and warmer and warmer. And they have been, uh, it's overwhelming the snow's capacity to absorb any more of this melt water. And it's started to cause runoff in areas, um, where water is no longer trickling into the snow, but just running off straight to the coast in areas that it never used to before, hmm. uh, areas high in the ice that all the water that, that, uh, melted used to just refreeze and stay put not contribute to sea level rise it would just refreeze and stay on the ice sheet uh but it's not anymore um and that's uh that's something that's been happening really quickly and that's what this paper we we have out is uh is talking about is these areas that that have lost their ability on the ice sheet to uh um to store any more meltwater and is causing runoff now in areas that it didn't used to so it's like the runoff zone of the ice sheet is growing quickly oh wow now you said you've been doing this you've been measuring this for the last 20 some years or looking at it in the recent changes in the last 20 some years is there evidence that this has happened in the past uh, beyond those 20 years uh i mean not recently uh i mean there was a paper out last year 
that they did some cores in the same types of areas we work in. Uh, they were drilling cores and uh, in areas where there's some summer melt, like the areas we study, you can actually tell how much summer melt there was in the past by drilling down into cores. Uh, and they've shown that the melt in the last uh, couple of decades is more than has happened in at least the last 350 years. Like, so you, um, Yeah, so you're seeing an emergent uh, trend here that, that we haven't seen in the past at, at all. Yeah, right. In at least the past 350 years, likely at least the last 5,000 years. Um, yeah, when I say recent to a geologist, I I, I know that recent <laughs> yeah, might not mean it might not mean last week or something. But yeah. uh, so I'm assuming this is can be attributed to uh, cl- climate change, or is that absolutely. not an assumption I can make? No, this is is completely an assumption because um, it's 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 due completely to a warming summer temperatures and the Arctic. Greenland included has been warming uh, twice as fast as the rest of the planet, uh, and uh, it's the, you know, some of the fastest warming areas of the planet up in the Arctic. So, and, so uh, yeah. So now, so now what? I mean, now that we know that it's, we have this melting and the runoff faster. Now what? I mean, <laughs> this, this, well, the, now it's just a, <laughs> it's it's the bigger. Tell us, Mike. What do we, we do? The bigger yeah. question was was uh, that we were answering in this paper was how bad is it going to get? So we modeled out to twenty one hundred. Um, oh. How big these areas of the ice sheet that are now running off that didn't used to run off but are now running off as things continue to warm, we expect those to get bigger and bigger. These areas and uh, to cover larger and larger parts of the ice sheet. And so, um, and using climate models uh, out to the year 2100. Um, we did that uh, and showed that they actually matched the current observations fairly well um, and uh, and then ran them out to 2100. And uh, it was it's pretty scary. Um, I mean, this, mm-hmm. these areas already, it's an area about um, 27,000 square miles, about the size of the state of West Virginia is the area that Greenland's runoff zone has grown in the last 20 years. Um, Wow, that's above and beyond the size it was before. Uh, so it's it's grown by like a, an extra twenty six percent, be uh, bigger than it used to be, uh, and that's expected to at least double uh, by twenty fifty. But what the models were showing is that, depending on greenhouse gas emissions, um, if they just keep going up and keep going up and keep going up, then it's just going to keep doubling beyond that up to twenty one hundred. Uh, and it just keeps ramping up faster and faster and faster. Uh, whereas if greenhouse gas emissions did get cut to where by the end, by mid century, you were able to, um, able to cut them, stabilize carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere. In, in other words, stop emitting any more CO2 mm-hmm. in the atmosphere and things would level off that the melt in Greenland then levels off. It's still worse than it was before, but it levels off yeah. essentially yeah. stopped it from getting worse. If we hold where we are now, does it keep going? For a little while. I mean, there's definitely inertia in the climate system. So mm-hmm. if you could actually just tomorrow say, all right, no more fossil fuels. We'll just keep the concentrations right where they are right now. Um, sort of a green Thanos. He just snaps his right, fingers. Yeah, exactly. Um, and uh, if you were, if you did that, then um, it would, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it would it would keep warming for a little while, um, mm-hmm. although it's actually a little more complicated than that. Because if you... If you stopped emitting all emissions, then some of the CO2 over time would be absorbed and actual concentrations would go down a little ways, which so it would, it would start to heal after a while. Oh, okay. uh, but, uh, um, but yeah, I mean, if you just kept them right where they're at, it would keep warming for a little while because the oceans keep absorbing heat. And uh, yeah. um, it's basically until the Earth came back into equilibrium. Right now, it's not in equilibrium, so it's we're absorbing, still absorbing heat that's not being released and it's entering the system all the time. Uh, mm-hmm. But uh, um, so I mean, this might sound like a naive question, but yeah, I think listeners have it. Why is it bad? I mean, you you kind of said like you know it can get pretty bad, but what's going to make it bad? Well, the I mean, humanity. Well, there's a <laughs> couple ways to answer this. I guess first off, if you if we take a very as humans are apt to do, we take a very self centric view of it. Uh, yeah. Humanity, like the entire growth of civilization in the last 10,000 years has all happened in an extremely stable climate, very okay. stable. And we're essentially as fast as we can in the last 150 years, shoving it out of a of stability and shoving it back into a much more chaotic system that 
the earth has seen in the past. It's seen very chaotic and very rapid climate changes in the past. Unfortunately, many of the most rapid of those climate changes also corresponded with mass extinctions on the planet where 90, mm-hmm. 95, 98 percent of all species were wiped out. Uh, and, you know, over millions of years, it, the, the earth re-evolved and repopulated with whole new populations of plants and animals. But that's not much comfort to someone who's actually causing or living through a mass extinction. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, uh, I mean, that's that's really, you know, uh, it, sure. and, and that's you're creating boundaries for us to think about uh, our doom. Yeah. I mean, that's that's. So Greenland, th- this yeah. this case kind of serves as one of many indicators as to what what is happening because of climate change. Absolutely, yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's uh, I hate to say it's the uh, a canary in the coal mine because it's yeah. actually it's not it's more than that. Um, it it is the coal it's mine. A condor. It's, uh, it, it's it's <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's this is uh, I mean, sea level from Greenland is a big a, a big concern to a whole lot of people that live on coastlines all over the world. Uh, there's enough ice in Greenland. If it all melted, um, and to be clear, our paper doesn't say it's all going to melt this century, but, uh, but if it did all melt, it would raise seas by 20 some odd feet, 23 feet. Mm. Um, Antarctica, mm. it melted all of Antarctica. It's another 200 feet. Uh, and in which case there's a whole lot of coastal cities that don't exist anymore. Um, so, but even, even a foot, or two or three extra change makes a huge difference. Uh, and so those, but those are the kinds of things the changes we're locking in right now, uh, mm-hmm. in, by shoving this whole climate system in, in an area, in areas where, you know, for hundreds of years, you could build houses right on the coast and it was fine because sea levels were stable and, uh, uh, and they're not anymore and they will not be anymore. And so that's, mm-hmm. that's a major concern. So, so now, now, when, when I, I, I took, took a glacial, glacial geology, geology course, course in college, college and, you know, you know we, we learned about, about a lot of terms, terms that, that were basically given by German scientists, uh, like Gesundheitsstraßen, for instance. Sure. Are, are we going to see some, like, uh, glacial melting terms coming out of Danish vocabulary now that kind of speak and hearken our doom here? <laughs> uh, potentially. Um, I mean, it's not a Danish term, but we had to coin a new term for for what this paper was showing, these areas where, uh, where these ice layers right under the surface of the snow were now blocking any more water and it's causing runoff. Um, uh, we we're calling them ice slabs. These, these ice slabs across Greenland mm-hmm. that, uh, that again, cover about the size of the state of West Virginia, but are, that are prepped to cover larger than the state of Texas by the end of the century. Uh, if, uh, if we just keep, keep warming things up in Greenland. And so, um, uh, and we'd, we'd been batting around back and forth what to call these things because there really wasn't a term for these this exact phenomenon. These aren't little thin ice lenses and ice layers that you see in snow under the surface that they've always seen and people have always measured. You can dig a snow pit or drill a core and pull up these little layers of ice in the snow. But when these things are getting three feet thick, 10 feet thick, 20 feet thick, uh, they're no longer these little thin layers. Um you know, which these little thin layers might be an inch thick or two inches thick. Uh, mm-hmm. And uh, and we're seeing, you know, you you go down and there's 25 feet of ice right under the surface. And mm-hmm. there's still hundreds of feet of snow underneath that where water should be able to absorb, but it can't anymore because it can't get through that slab of ice on the surface. And so um, we coined the terms ice slabs for this paper because uh, mm. it sort of conveyed the uh the thickness of these things um sure, sure. and it's basically like the greenland greenland as we warm it it's 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 forming a hard shell around it like a scared turtle or something it's just uh it's it's increasingly higher and higher on the ice it's just it's forming this hard shell around it uh that can't absorb water anymore and it's just going to increase the amount of meltwater beyond what was already projected um it's going to increase it even more hmm. uh, than it was previously thought is it difficult to stay positive when you make discoveries like this or you do this research and it's like, oh, no, more melting? It is. You know, I have kids. Um, mm-hmm. My oldest is 13, about to enter high school. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I mean, when I sit back and take a look at the scale and the magnitude of these changes happening, I mean, when we're out in Greenland, we, you know, we can drive for weeks and be on top of these things, and 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 you just realize this is like a continental size problem. Uh, yeah. And uh, knowing that we're 
we're hand, that's the world we're handing down to kids who had nothing to do with making it, um, it or, not with, or nothing to do with making those problems um, is, is really uh, – that's hard to deal with. But from a scientific standpoint, making these new discoveries is exciting. We're discovering new things. Um, it used to be back in the 90s, early 90s, 80s, 90s that – glaciology was seen as a not a dying field but a bit of you know they discovered the big things that happen to glaciers and how glaciers work and how they flow and and, uh, we're done with glaciers now we got it we got it wrapped up (laughs) there were still things to discover but the big you know the big laws of of glacial flow and whatnot were all known um that was also back when you know ice sheets took thousands and thousands of years to be built and therefore they would take thousands and thousands of years to melt away uh and that was the reigning idea and uh and there were a few voices that said, well, actually, like West Antarctica, you know, might be vulnerable in a hypothetically changing climate. Um, and now those, you know, those hypotheticals are coming true. All the all the knobs are turning and suddenly things start waking up. All these processes start waking up around the ice sheets. So, uh, so it's actually a very exciting time to be a glaciologist. There's a lot going on in this field and there's uh. a, there's a lot of people who care about it. But uh Unfortunately, Unfortunately, you get to see the reverse of, of you know, the, 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 the building, building up of glaciers. glaciers. You're, you're studying the reversing of that. that. Yeah, and it turns out you can actually destroy an ice sheet much faster than you can build one. Hmm. No, that may, yeah. Well, and it, one of the other things I remember, I remember doing a paper on uh, the telescoping of vegetation as glaciers, you know, advanced and receded sure. um, from, from the past, of course. And yeah. uh, what do you see in terms of, do you, or do you see any kinds of local ecosystem changes from from these rapid melting and and not absorbing the water. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of cascading effects um, from this stuff. Uh, the I mean, as more runoff comes off of Greenland, uh, it's you get a lot of fresh cold water entering the North Atlantic um, that stays buoyed on the surface. It's actually starting to already slow down. There's been some press about the slowdown of the Gulf Stream current that that runs up along the east coast of the U.S. and uh, and then it's actually part of why – a large part of why Europe is warmer than it should be even though it's at the same uh, um, same latitudes as mm-hmm. – Oh, yeah. It's much warmer because the Gulf Stream of warm water from uh, the Caribbean and South Atlantic uh, pumps its way up past Greenland over to, over to northern Europe. Uh, that's slowing down um, in part because of melt from Greenland, uh, which is both going to affect Europe's climate but then also uh, it's actually – that slowdown is causing sea levels around uh, the um, the U.S. Atlantic coast, uh, the the eastern seaboard, to rise faster, roughly double the pace of of global sea level rise on the average. Um, so, if you live in New York, you care about that, and uh, uh, it's and things like in Antarctica, um, they've been seeing huge changes. There was just a a paper out today about uh, um, changes in sea ice around Antarctica, uh, having as Things um, are changing rapidly down there. Uh, the the Southern Ocean, um, the amount of carbon dioxide that can be absorbed by that um, is changing pretty dramatically. Uh, it was actually rising for a number of of decades and then dropping off, uh, looking expected to be dropping off significantly in the coming decades. And it's uh, due to ecosystem changes there. The amount of um, plankton that can uh, and and small tiny crustaceans that can uh, that can feed on the surface based on circulation changes uh, due to climate changes down there. There's all these effects all over the world, uh, and some of them really aren't expected. Um, when you have a civilization, civilization that grew up to things being pretty dang stable and, and our entire infrastructure is built on that, uh, incorporating rapid changes is, is not something these sy- any of our systems were really built for. Mm. Now, you have also discovered some unexpected things in Greenland as well. Can you tell us more about that? The U.S. military during the Cold War, and for students who weren't alive during the Cold War, it's when... uh, (laughs) This has nothing to do with Greenland because it's cold, by the way, kids. Yes, uh, but uh, (laughs) uh, for several decades, um, you know, from more or less the 50s onward, the U.S. and uh, what was then the, the... Soviet Russia, the USSR, were in kind of a, a long standoff um, where they didn't like each other and they built up bi- bases and missiles and all sorts of things just in case the two countries ever declared war on each other. And that's mm-hmm. what they call it the Cold War because it never actually broke out in a global nuclear war. But um, 
but there was always that readiness in case it had to. And the U.S., as part of that effort, built several big bases up in Greenland. Uh, one of them still there, Thule Air Force Base, is still operational in northwest Greenland on the coast. Uh, but one of the more curious of these bases they built was one called Camp Sentry. It's this base they built actually up high on the ice sheet, uh, these kinds of areas where we drive around our snowmobiles. Um, and they built this entire base under the surface of the ice. So they dug out these huge trenches, kilometers of these huge trenches, miles of them. Like uh, Hoth? And then and then covered them with roofs, buried it all in snow. And so they had all this network of tunnels just under the surface, like Hoth. Yeah, I mean, you'd be oh. walking in these snow tunnels. <laughs> and, uh, and this base could, could, could hold up to 250 soldiers. Um, it operated from about 1959 and was decommissioned in 1967. Uh, it was actually part of a uh, of a somewhat crazy test plan to see if you could actually deploy nuclear missiles from the ice sheet. They never did do that, but oh, um, wow. it turns out that's hard to do. But uh, <laughs> it's uh, <laughs> but that was the plan to actually test that out. It's part of why Camp Century existed. But they also did a lot of scientific research there. Um, but like this entire base for a number of years was powered by a portable nuclear reactor. They actually carted in a, nu- a small nuclear reactor and, and powered the whole base with this electricity off of this. Oh, wow. uh, and, and when they decommissioned the base in 1967, uh, almost everything there was actually more expensive to cart off the ice than the stuff was actually worth. So they just left it all behind. Um, they took the nuclear reactor with them, but they left behind all the waste, all the buildings, all uh, the nuclear wastewater uh, was pumped in a heated pipes a kilometer away and dumped in the snow, and that's all still there. Um, all the fuel caches, everything from this base was just literally left buried there, uh, and they walked away. And uh, it's been sitting there for 50 years. And if things were staying the same, uh, if climate was stable, then actually that stuff would just remain buried for centuries, for millennia. It would this The ice there moves like three meters a year. It's hundreds of miles inland. It'd take tens of thousands of years for that stuff to spit out of the end of the glacier out to the coast. But, uh, but we found in a changing climate that actually uh, it could be as soon as the end of the century that there's going to be enough meltwater up there uh, that instead of the layers of snow adding layer, layer, layer after layer, like tree rings or like an onion, it's being peeled away. It'll be peeled away year after year after year. Uh, wow. by enough melt. And so eventually this stuff's just going to melt out on the surface. All this stuff that was supposed to stay buried. Somebody's, you know, the U.S. military's dirty little secret. Buried in the mm-hmm. ice, but he'd see it. Uh, he's not going to stay buried. It'll just keep snowing, everyone. It'll be okay. Uh, and so we put out a paper about this base and about the model projections um, there, and uh, uh, it got a little got a, got got some interest, some public interest, got a little press mm-hmm. when, that, when that story came out. Um, I could send you a link to it if you wanted, uh, but uh, um, and some the, the pictures are really fascinating. There's a whole little video about it too. I'm, I'm actually looking some up now. I'm going yeah. down a click spiral. It's yeah, kind of fascinating. Can't, can't venture e Greenland. Yeah. So uh, when was this discovered? Well, we. I mean, revealed, I guess, or uh, the the paper, I and mean, it's an interesting backstory of that the it was a colleague of mine uh, that works in Denmark, um, whose whose uh, sort of brainchild this this particular paper was. Um, he had been looking up like all the literature that was public about Camp Century. It wasn't really a secret. It was, it was, um, they knew about it. They knew about it. Just nobody was okay. paying any attention to it. Uh, and, uh, cause it was all still getting buried. It, it is still getting buried, but uh-huh. in a warming climate, it won't keep getting buried. That was, that was the new big deal. Um, and, uh, and so we were trying to get actual like scientific funding to go up and, and do a whole big complete study and survey of this area, uh, it cost quite a bit of money to get in there, but we come in there and do drill some cores and do some radar surveys and really do a very detailed study of like how much stuff is down there and how big of a risk is it and how and um and we couldn't get the funding. Nobody would nobody would fund us to do that from Denmark, from the U.S., from from anybody who would have any culpability or responsibility for those for those wastes. And uh, so we just put out a paper with what we had. Well, here's what we know and. Uh, uh, and that was in 2016, a few years ago. Um, and then it kind of blew up in the press and the, the country of Denmark, because when this base was put in, Greenland didn't have home rule. It didn't have its own government like it does now. It was essentially just a territory of the kingdom of Denmark at the time. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so Denmark got under a lot of heat, international pressure, and actually started a camp century monitoring program there now, which my colleague who ran that paper now runs. Uh, so they, did exactly what we were trying to do is, is go up there and, and monitor in more detail 
uh, these areas. They did a whole, whole big radar survey there. And um, if you look up the Camp Century Monitoring Project or Monitoring Program, um, you'll see my colleague there uh, and their reports on it. But uh, um, so it was actually kind of very satisfying in that case. It's very rare that when we put out a new science result that suddenly public policy like immediately takes notice. Uh, but in that yeah. case, it did because um, like the... The foreign affairs minister of Denmark wrote a scathing op-ed uh, to the biggest Danish newspaper in Copenhagen and, and, and really lit into them about military wastes and, uh, and the rest. And, uh, and since then, Denmark is, has at least decided to monitor it. Nobody's actually taken to cleaning it up yet, um, but it's, it's being monitored. So, uh, um, so when it does start melting out, we'll be aware of it. Hmm. Well, that's fascinating, and that's kind of a. Obviously, we we know that sometimes science takes you into unexpected areas, and sometimes it's an abandoned Cold War facility. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've I've been inside, not of Camp Century. Nobody's been inside of there for going on fifty years now. But but there's other bases that were built on the ice. Uh, one of them is a big radar station um, called Dai Two, D Y E Dai Two, and uh, in South Greenland that. Uh, you can still get inside. It's this big six-story building with a radar dish on top hmm. that uh, uh, that you can. See. It's been condemned since 1988, but but somebody long ago broke the lock off, and you can actually, if you're up there, you can walk into it, uh, <laughs> walk around inside, and it's really creepy. They abandoned it one day in 1988. Literally, just packed up their stuff and left. Uh, and there's still there's still food on the shelves. There's still eggs in the fridge. There's still books on the in the little library there's like in you know calendars on the wall and you're walking around in there and paints peeling off the walls because it's been there for you know 30 years like a like a cold chernobyl kind of a thing right yeah and you're walking around inside it's so creepy it's like oh man if anywhere was going to be haunted this would be it but uh (laughs) um but yeah you can walk around inside there and uh i've yeah i've uh, been in there a number of times because that's actually where we fly into when we uh when we're putting uh, doing mm-hmm. our campaigns on the ice, they land us on a runway just outside of there, which used sure. to be the same same runway and the ice they used to supply that military base. So even though the military base has been condemned for thirty years, they still maintain that snow runway sure. for scientific expeditions now. Well, we've learned a lot from from you, from what you do and where you've been, and some of the research that you've you've you shared with us here today. If you were to leave any kind of ad- advice or wisdom to you've got the you've got the ear of teachers in the in the in the public school system and private school system and universities, um, you've got students that might be listening. What do you want to leave them with, Mike? Uh, I mean, about science. What I've learned about the process of science. Um, don't be afraid to fail. In fact, if you're doing a project where you already know what the outcome is going to be, you're probably not trying hard enough. Uh, hmm. My first measurements on the ice sheet, I was installing instruments uh, when we discovered these big ice slabs that are that are now causing these huge speed ups of runoff in Greenland. Um, that wasn't what I set out to do. I actually installed instruments on the ice that in the summer of 2012 completely melted out and were completely destroyed. I actually got no usable data whatsoever, which given how much work I'd put into getting these things built and, and then getting out onto the ice to put them in, uh, was a really big disappointment. Um, I, it was like, oh man, that's like, that was my PhD work was just literally going down the tubes. Uh, and, uh, but what we ended up discovering what was happening up there, um, with this melt and runoff feedbacks ended up being a much, much bigger thing. And it's, it's, it's a big, big paper we've got out now. Um, that's, uh, but it was because – it was essentially because the first experiment that I was running, which was actually, frankly, much less interesting, um, but w- completely failed. Uh, huh. And that's uh, – um, try things that you're, you're not sure are going to work uh, and try them anyway. Those are often the most valuable ones, whether they work or not. Hmm. Well, thank you so much for your time, Mike. We uh, look forward to hearing more about your work. Well, actually, I don't look forward to hearing more about the results from your work. <laughs> but uh, we, it was a pleasure to have you on your on our show and uh, talk to us about what you do. Sure. Thanks to the both of you. Thanks for listening to this episode of Lab Out Loud. If you'd like to learn more about some of the things discussed in this episode or previous episodes, you can find show notes at our website, laboutloud.com. If you have a guest idea or a future topic that you'd like to see on Lab Out Loud, go to our contact page and send us a message. Also, you can subscribe to Lab Out Loud on your favorite podcasting app, such as Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, 
Google Play, or wherever you like to find podcasts. While you're there, leave us a review and rating. Your input helps others find our show. Thanks again for listening.